Perseus works with a beautiful thief to win over the college's most popular girl at an auction house. Somebody write this. Welcome to Somebody Write This, where we use a random plot generator to give us an idea, and then we brainstorm how that could be a thing somebody might want to write. I'm Hannah. And I'm Jenny. And to help us with our brainstorming today, we have a guest. Let's welcome Callista Kern Lyons. Hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Excited to have you on this podcast because I wanted to talk a little bit about your YouTube channel, which is book based. So tell us a little bit about what this channel is and what you do with it. Yeah, so my channel is called A Novel Beauty, and so I basically wanted to combine my love of, like, artistic beauty stuff and stories, because I absolutely adore reading and writing. So basically, the main thing I do is book looks, so I review books and I create makeup looks inspired by them, so... Uh, I do also do a couple other things, you know, just more like general bookish tag YouTube things <laughs> um, and a couple like actual just beauty things. But that's the main thing I do. And the main reason I started it was just I wanted to combine two things I love. What an original idea. I am not into makeup tutorials at all. And I really enjoy watching your channel because <laughs> I like seeing the, the different ways that you connect the artistic visual side of it to the story. Which genres do you find tend to really lend themselves to immediate ideas for this? Ooh. Well, which ones are most difficult? <laughs> that might be a good one, too. <laughs> yeah. I would say fantasy and, like, historical fiction would probably be the easiest. Because with historical fiction, I can obviously pull from makeup looks in or makeup trends in history. So I've done that quite a bit. Um, and then fantasy, there's usually just a lot of fun ways you can go with it. I would say the hardest, and I haven't done this yet on purpose, is nonfiction and just stories that are really heavy because they don't usually feel, it, it just doesn't feel right to like be putting on my makeup while I'm talking about things that are really serious. So there are some things where I'm like, it just doesn't quite feel appropriate to do for a book look. And then just nonfiction in general just feels like it's just a little harder to come up with ideas for. <laughs> So you're also, you're a theater person too. And so I'm curious as to how this might, how this crosses over for you or connects to you to stage makeup or, or makeup design for, for the stage, for taking something that's on the page and putting it visually in front of people. I haven't really thought about how my channel connects to theater much outside of like, you know, the actual like talking to a camera. As far as like the makeup design goes, I mean, whenever I'm on stage, I tend, you know, I do my own makeup. So that's always... That's always fun, but I always have someone like telling me what to do. You're pulling from the specific era of history. You're doing the specific thing. But I think as far as like the actual creative portion of it, like for the YouTube channel side, it is really fun to just like try and dream up what this might look like. Or if there's like a specific character where I'm like, oh my goodness, this would be so cool to create and trying to like think up or create how how it might work like sometimes I'll like sit and I'll like actually like draw it out so I can see if it would be feasible yeah, yeah. and other times I just kind of go in with a vague plan and I'm just like yeah what'll be will be <laughs> as you do your your makeup looks you're also reviewing the book and sometimes you do just straight book reviews how has creating book reviews for the public to watch how has that changed the way that you read books I think I come at it with a little bit more critical eye and it, it feels more like when you're like reading books for a literature class in school and you know you, you're going to have to do a book report on it. Like it's kind of like that feeling. <laughs> um, and I take notes now while I read. Like I didn't used to do that. I just used to, you know, like just fully, fully engage and just read straight through. But now I'm just more like, okay, what are things I like? What are things I don't like? How is the pacing? How are the characters? How's the writing style? Like I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself these questions as I'm reading. And so I, and I mean, I just take notes on my, like on my notes app on my phone. So it's nothing like too intense. Mm -hmm. I don't really organize them until after I've finished reading. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to take myself too much out of the story, but I would say that's definitely the biggest thing is just, it's, it's a lot more of a critical eye to the stories. 
Uh, well, thank you, Callista. We'll share at the end about how you can find uh, Callista's YouTube, and we'll make sure and share it in the show description as well. But it is time for us to move into the brainstorming section of the show. So mm-hmm. as a reminder, our plot is Perseus works with a beautiful thief to win over the college's most popular girl at an auction house. So Callista's first question when we saw this was, <laughs> is this Greek Perseus? This isn't right. This is just a normal human, <laughs> which is kind of where I'm leaning as well, that it's it gets way more complicated if you have to try to make it the Greek <laughs> right <Christology> like, Perseus. <laughs> you're yeah, adding in like time travel or something I don't know <laughs> and it'd it get really complicated <laughs> yeah I like the idea it's just a random dude named Perseus living in modern-ish enough times that, that women are going to college yes so, at least yes. in the last the last century for sure so he's so yeah trying to win over the a popular girl at an auction house and working with a thief to do so is the thief stealing from the auction house? Is that why the thief is involved? That kind of is what I was thinking. Like, and I mean, maybe the auction house is selling like an artist that the girl really likes or something. Does okay, he work okay. with the thief to steal a piece of art so he can impress the girl with it? Is she stealing to impress her with the art? Or is she stealing for Perseus to stop her to impress the girl? Like, like, oh. is it a setup? Like, I'm gonna, like, she's an actual Faking thief, but us. this time they're working together. Like, I'm going to pretend to steal this painting, and you pretend to stop me, and then you're like, you'll be the hero. Hmm. Maybe that could work as long as it was like, I mean, if if I was a thief, <laughs> I I would be worried about a fake robbery setup because I would be worried that I would get uh, legitimately caught. It, it's true. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think that would be a hard. <laughs> convince the thief to do okay, <laughs> it's okay. a fake crime is it a really good uh defense so maybe she's not a real thief the beautiful thief could be a guy too that's true could be like just does perseus also go to college oh if not how did he meet her yes it sounds like he is just because it says the college's most popular girl like i mean unless that's he just true. like just the context makes it sound like he's at college although we could make it that he's not but yeah or maybe he's like a maybe he's like a kid who a kid like college age kid. Um, <laughs> They're kids who, uh, who works. Maybe he works at the college. Maybe he's like on the janitorial staff or something. But he's but he's not attending. <laughs> Adjunct professor, and you're like janitorial staff. <laughs> like, well, I, was, I was trying to veer away from professors trying to lose students. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's I was true. about to say that would be okay, okay. Unless that happens, and then we then take him down. <laughs> okay, what if he's an IT guy? Yeah, or. He also didn't have to attend, like, he could be just out of college, but not this one. Like, maybe he's, maybe he's, yeah, not adjunct professor, but maybe he's, like, a tutor. Right, like uh, a teacher's assistant. Yeah. Like, maybe he's an aide. Like, maybe he works with a student who, like, needs uh, needs stuff transcribed or needs, um, and so he sits in with this person's classes and ends up. Oh, interesting. Up. Is that how he knows the thief? Is the thief a student, the student he was helping? Oh, and then he, like, blackmails him. He's like, you have to help me by pretending to steal some art. <laughs> Oh, that's so mean. <laughs> Perseus might be a jerk. Do we really want our main character to be a jerk? It's a lot harder to be relatable. So maybe, maybe Perseus is a jerk, but eventually the beautiful thief and the girl get together. Ooh. And that mm. I can root for. Um, I, I, I could root for that. <laughs> or maybe, maybe Perseus works not at the, maybe he's not at the college. Maybe he's at the, maybe he does something with the auction house. Oh, okay. And so he, and he knows her because she, maybe she's an art student and she just absolutely loves it. And she comes by and he talks with her about it. It's so it's an inside it. job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Which would make it easier for him to guarantee. I, I think it would be easier for him to sell that the thief wouldn't get caught in that case. Ooh. If he has strengths he can pull from within right in, in which case the thief doesn't even need to be directly involved maybe he just gets info from the thief to make it look like an actual theft because he wants to win the girl but he also doesn't want to lose his job at the auction okay house. so he's security guard at the auction house um, okay he catches the thief <laughs> Ooh. like legitimately and says hey i won't turn you in if <laughs> you help me <laughs> win this the heart of this woman Interesting. And so that's what. So that's why the thief does it because it's it's a better chance that they'll get away if it's otherwise they have no chance of getting away because they've already been caught. Right. Hmm. And that gives them a motivation to work with him. I like that. He's still kind of scummy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. How much of a relationship does he have with this girl? Like, is this a creepy love from afar, and he hasn't ever really spoken to her, or have they like had conversations? 
Yeah, did they like have classes together before he graduated and started working at the auction house? Maybe he he is taking classes part time or took them and had to drop out. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he knew her from before he works at the, at the auction house. Maybe he took the job at the auction house because he knew she went there and is a little stalkery. Yeah, it could be, um, like I was thinking, like if she was doing some type of like TA thing, like, and he took, he took like a, I don't know, art history class or something, like maybe she was the TA for it. And so that would give them more, more of a chance of actually interacting because like, you have to like email your TA and, you know, like Mm -hmm. get it's upgraded and like it it creates a i feel like that could have the opportunity to create a lot more of like a false relationship on his end man i, I feel like perseus is either a jerk or like a sap like yeah. this poor guy <laughs> rushing on this girl he's a deeply flawed character either way i know we, can, we can't seem to fix him <laughs> somehow we have to make this guy re- like somewhat relatable <laughs> we can make it a little ambiguous about like how how manipulative he's being versus maybe he does maybe he also like wanted to be an art student for real and he like did have legitimate yeah. motives for wanting to take this job <laughs> and so everything could have like double meanings and it just also happens to be that he knows that she'll come by i feel like the title may help us at this point or hurt us yeah uh, I feel like we need more I, it is about time for that our title is the sinister conspiracy Ooh. okay so, this so just perseus got bigger. Sinister. <laughs> it's got bigger than just perseus and a thief so that almost immediately makes me think that the thief is kind of like double like double working like mm. intentionally gets caught and like kind of kind of knows that he's going to do something like knows his weaknesses like and is mm-hmm. like part of this bigger plan. So it's not yeah. Perseus blackmailing the thief, it's the thief blackmailing Perseus like, "Hey, if you help me with this, I will help you get the popular girl." That or just like being really, really manipulative, like letting him think he's the one in charge when actually like he or she's the one that's really, really making the plans. Has Perseus and the thief been working together for a little bit and Perseus wants out? That makes sense with Perseus working at an auction house. Like maybe they are, maybe they were able actually to get him the job at the auction house <laughs> um, in in preparation for some big plan. And Perseus is like, well, while I'm here, would you help me with my love life? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'm like, maybe he and the beautiful thief become somewhat legitimate friends. <laughs> and he's like, hey, is this something we could do? Oh, it's like a good unlikely friendship. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And maybe the intention is he does this and then quits the auction house because he doesn't want to be part of this anymore he's just like the only he's like but i can't i can't quit because right now it's the only chance i get to see this woman who i'm in love with and so he's so he gets manipulative with it but you can kind of swing it as a i don't know you could kind of swing that yeah no i think that's not sinister enough (laughs) well but i feel like i feel like if you have like this like this bigger I don't know, group of thieves or something in the background, that makes it a lot more sinister because there's this Mm. pressure on him. Like, can I really leave? Like, I know about them. If I leave, will they just like kill me? Or we go back to the original premise where Perseus knows nothing about this. He just catches a thief breaking in one night, persuades the thief to help him out. And then after the fake crime is committed, then from then on, things escalate and it becomes a sinister conspiracy that now he and this woman are now at the center of. (laughs) <laughs> because mm. maybe the thief was like double agenting or whatever uh, and this really messed them over and so now they're coming up to Perseus and the college woman to make things right <laughs> and they're like we have no idea this was happening I don't know about you guys but I've already cast Perseus in my head as Josh Radner <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not too far off from where I was going right uh, so, but yeah, so then you could have, because I think we need to know like whether this works or not. Like, mm. and so that could be a thing is that you have the quote unquote happy ending halfway through where he got the, he got the girl and it's great. And then all of a sudden, oh no, kidding. That move you made turns out to be connected to an art thieving crime syndicate. Okay. I kind of like that. Kind of like act yeah. one, act two into the woods kind of thingy. Mm-hmm. I, I like, like that. It. Yeah. You're just like, oh crap, it's a happy ending halfway through. <laughs> it doesn't end well. Which begs the question, what does the popular girl, whether or not he wins her over, she's part of the story now, what does she bring to the fight against the conspiracy? I think she gets him out of it. 
she's being manipulated so hard in the first half of the story that I think we have to redeem her in the second half, uh, or not redeem her, but give her some agency in the second half and have her, Perseus is just overwhelmed and keeps making things worse. <laughs> oh, absolutely. He's the protagonist, um, but I think she's the hero. Yeah. And so yeah. she just steps up and has to, he, he has to he has to come clean and be like, so this is what happened. And this is, and she's like, well, I'm going to help fix your mess. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, if she really is like an art major person, like I feel like that could give her some, I feel like that could give her some skills to kind of help along the way. Yeah, like she's she has more information about like what is what's going missing, what's valuable, and and yeah. can put pieces together that maybe he can't. Right, she's kind of like the Watson that's just providing all the helpful little information in the background. Or maybe she has the actual connections to like the art world, where he just works yeah. at an auction house, but like her uncle's actually a dealer or something or a painter. And, and I think as well, like, I think we, as well, we can really draw out the, the personality changes as well, that we have Perseus who is, who will dig into what is actually a pretty terrible idea <laughs> to, <laughs> to try to get what he wants because he panics. Maybe there's like a deadline on this. Like maybe she's, she's gotten a job elsewhere and is about to graduate or he's no, no. about to move or he's about to get, he, he overhears and knows he's about to get fired at the auction house or something. And so there's a deadline, he panics and he makes this terrible plan. <laughs> And then you can have her on the other side who is not, is not making terrible big decisions because she's freaking out. She's like, well, this is what we're in. We're going to fix this. And then you're going to go away and I'm not going to talk to you ever again. Because this, each was, other. It's so cute. <laughs> this is really bad. She um, sounds like she has like a level head on her shoulders. Yeah. I appreciate that. She's like, you poor sad puppy. And she's like, and I'm only cleaning this up because I am in the middle of this and I want to get out um, because you should have to crawl your way out of this yourself. And then maybe he ends up a better person at the end. I would like to think so. But I, the more I get into this, the more I don't want them to end up together. I know. <laughs> we'll have to leave that up to the writers, I guess. I think before you're in a, a serious relationship, you have to have gone for at least a year without having manipulated them into dating you by faking uh, <laughs> crimes. That's fair. That's the checklist. It's a parole type situation where he needs to feel right. lie low for a while. This fleshed out to something that actually is kind of a, a fun little weird, what yeah. sounds like a rom-com at first and then turns into like a mystery spy heist story. But also still comedy. <laughs> but also still comedy. Okay, and we are we have like a minute or two left. Is there anything that we would want to add to this? Anything that we're <sighs> missing? I feel like you need to do something with the thief. Like... They, yes. Like, are they just, are they purely, like, the hand of the antagonist, or do they have other motivations in there? Like, are they going to end up friends with someone or no? I, I was going to ask, actually, on a similar note, and I think these can go together, we have adjectives attached to these characters, and we don't, we haven't fleshed out why that's important. Why it is, is it important that the thief is beautiful, and why is it important that the girl is popular? Is it, that might just be because she seems unattainable, but we have no, we have no plot reason for the thief to be beautiful. So maybe that will help. What I'm thinking for the beautiful thief is I'm kind of thinking of like a Neil Caffrey situation where they're just like, they're just so charming and beautiful that they can kind of talk their way in and out of any situation. And it makes it a lot easier for them to steal whatever they want because people don't suspect them because they're, they're beautiful. <laughs> like, oh, this, I wasn't supposed to carry it out. Whoopsie. <laughs> so does that beauty play into the relationship that they have with Perseus? Like, has Perseus succumbed to the beauty in the past and, like, let her get away with stuff? Well, well that, that's, um, that's one of the ideas I had. Like, maybe maybe Perseus, like, maybe was even, was attracted to the thief or was even with the thief before deciding to go after the popular girl. Hmm. But that depends on what their relationship was before they started working together, which we okay, so, decided. No, I like that. Perseus and the thief were, they, they were together and then they separated. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And now, so that's why the thief, when agrees to come on board to help him win this other person, <laughs> but, <laughs> but ends up, but ends up getting him in trouble because she's like, uh, no, <laughs> like it's a petty revenge thing against her ex, being like, I can't believe you asked me to do this thing, which a is manipulative all on its own, but b that you wanted me to help you with this. <laughs> And He's manipulative and, and pathetic at the same time. It's really sad. Uh, and maybe maybe she didn't realize it was going to go that far, but like definitely did something that like ended up connecting him to the conspiracy because she was like, I don't want to do this. This is dumb. <laughs> or this is, I can't believe you'd ask me of this. And I, or, you know, maybe Perseus has been a jerk for a while and was also a jerk when he dumped her. 
and has some learning to do. My poor protagonist has like no redeeming qualities. <laughs> I have the idea though of like setting him up as the protagonist in the first half, and then in the second half, you're like, oh wait. <laughs> like you write him just like so many other characters of very similar tropes. And then you're like, actually, this is not good. I like it, though. I like this story. I feel like you'd have to work really hard to make him not unlikable enough that people would still read past uh-huh. the first half. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and maybe some of the stuff doesn't even come out until part two. That's true. Like, maybe be some flashbacks. Yeah. Or maybe it's like, yeah, it's told from his point of view. And so he keeps like spitting stuff <laughs> or leaving stuff out. Got an unreliable narrator here. Very, very yeah. much Oh, so. yes. And then whether the second half switches perspectives or he just has to fess up about stuff, the second half can be like when you're like, wait a minute, I really hate this person now. <laughs> uh, who, who can I actually root for? And it's the popular girl. And maybe the beautiful thief comes back and is rootable for as well. And we go back to your original idea of having the thief run away with the popular girl. Yeah, I'm still, I still love that idea. <laughs> we'll to, somebody can write that in or not as they choose. Let's um, just leave Perseus to work on himself. Yeah. There's a lot of fun Perseus, options. Perseus is not in a, pla- a place to be with anybody yet. <laughs> let, him, <laughs> let him figure himself out and stop doing anything he's doing right now. <laughs> stop doing anything. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. I think this is I think this is a fun one and a, and a silly one. And I enjoy it a lot. Uh, awesome. Then let's let's start segueing on out, listeners. You've got this. Uh, take this. Write this. If you want to let us know why we're wrong about Perseus. Oh please yeah, do. please. Yeah. So see what we end up with with that. And in the meantime, we're going to scoot on to our uh, our recommendations section, where we're each going to shout out a story that we think our followers should check out. So in October, as I said a couple episodes ago, I've been watching only horror movies. And so one of the ones that I found that I just absolutely fell in love with um, is The Orphanage, which is a Spanish language horror movie. Um, earlier, actually, in an earlier podcast, I recommended the movie A Monster Calls. And it turns out, by complete coincidence, to be the exact same director. So my top two movies of the year that I've seen so far are from the same director. <laughs> so oh, clearly nice. I need to keep an eye out for this guy. Um, but The Orphanage, is, on, on its surface, it's just a, it's a basic um, ghost story. It's a, a, a woman who moves back to the orphanage that she lived in as a child and buys the home and wants to turn it into a, into a, a home for other ki- for kids with special needs. But her son disappears and um, she starts, she's hunting for him and she starts wondering if maybe the, the imaginary friends that he says he had weren't so imaginary. And it ended up, it was the first movie that I watched in October that both really scared me and really moved me deeply emotionally. I highly recommend it. It's really solid. And if you like anything by Guillermo del Toro, it's very much got that vibe. Um, mm. If you like Pan's Labyrinth or Devil's Backbone, absolutely check out The Orphanage. It's really good. I'm going to toss it over to Jenny. What would you like to recommend to our listeners this week? All right. I have kind of a nesting doll recommendation. The The general recommendation is if you enjoy short horror fiction, you need to go on Reddit and check out the subreddit No Sleep. It is a fantastic <laughs> conglomeration of short stories. A lot of them are one-offs. Some of them are series. Um, but the the number one rule on No Sleep is that Everything is true on No Sleep, even if it isn't. So as a commenter, as a reader, you pretend that everything that the poster posted was real. And so it's just got this really great vibe as a place to find horror stories. Now, the specific that I want to recommend is a series that I have been reading on there. And right now it's the only thing I'm reading on there because it is so good. It's called How to Survive Camping. And the first overarching plot of it has been actually uh, published as a book on Amazon, How to Survive Camping The Man with No Shadow by Bonnie Quinn. So the whole format of the story is is these posts by this campground manager named Kate and she talks about the rules of camping and she has the basic list of rules, you know, like where to put your tent, how to find water, you know, don't bother the other campers kind of rules. But it turns out that her campground is on what she calls old land. And on this land are not only human camping residents, but also ancient creatures of supernatural origin. And she has a whole list of rules regarding them for the camper's safety. Like, 
if children come by selling ice, if they don't have a wagon, just ignore them until they go away. Rule number six or whatever is like, don't follow the lights. Seriously, don't follow the lights and things like that. And so she's just been writing those posts and it's taken on a life of its own on the subreddit. And it's absolutely fascinating. And somebody besides me needs to read it. All right. Callista, what would you like to share with our listeners this week? All right. Uh, since it's October, I wanted to try and go for something with a little bit more of like a haunted vibe. Um, and one of my favorite books that I've read this year is called The Steep and Thorny Way by Cat Winters. It's actually a retelling of Hamlet. And it's set in 1920s Oregon. The main character is a biracial girl. And so she's basically trying to unravel the mystery of the death of her father, you know, in true Hamlet fashion. Uh Um, And it takes it in a really interesting way. Like it's not, it's not a, it's not a full retelling. Like there's twists where the author like inverted your expectations, which I found really, really interesting because there were some things where I was like waiting for something from the original to happen. And then it was just re- like it was reimagined or it was twisted in a really unique and interesting way. But having, I I think having that really set expectation made it even more interesting and kept me on the edge of my seat. And there were, you know, there's the ghosts and there's the aspect of magic that you see throughout a lot of uh, Shakespeare or Shakespeare retellings. And um, having that historical aspect to it made it really interesting and just, you know, focusing on a biracial character in the time period where that in and of itself was controversial was very, very interesting and also definitely added to the tension of the plot. And it was absolutely a five star read. And especially from like the halfway point on, I was completely on the edge of my seat. I read like the whole book in one sitting. I could not put it down. So good. Wow. I I think might have gotten that recommendation from you, but I recently added that to my own read list. So thank you for sharing that with our listeners. Now you can all add it to your read list too. Before we head on off, Calista, go ahead and share where, where anybody can find the stuff that you're working on. Uh, yeah, so if you want to find my YouTube channel, it is just a novel beauty, um, because puns. Um, <laughs> I also have an Instagram under the same name and a Facebook page, which is basically just the same thing as Instagram. So I would I would just follow the, <laughs> the YouTube or the Instagram, but I mean, do whatever you want. That's basically where you can find me. <laughs> Awesome. I'll make sure and put all those links in the show description as well so that people can find you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Callista. This was a, an interesting one. I feel like we del- we got to dive deep into character, which we don't usually. Usually we're so busy unraveling plot that the character themselves, the characters themselves don't really come out. So I really yeah. enjoyed getting to dive into the actual characters of these people with you. Characters are my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, That is our episode, folks. As a reminder, you can find us every other Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at WriteThisPod. And if you've been inspired by this episode and have questions or comments or a story or anything else, email us at somebodywritethis at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be back with another episode in two weeks and we'll see you then. And as they say, to be in the habit of no habit is the worst habit in the world. (laughs) 